Shalom, Shalom, people. Shabbat Shalom. Real quick, this ain't gonna take long. I wait for folk to um trail in here. It's a bit of a tail here, so there's a bit of a delay between when I speak and when you guys actually hear what I'm saying. Shabbat Shalom. I wanted to take just a second. Just a second. To share something with you that I have thought to be awesome for a second. Pursuant to Hebrew, speaking Hebrew, learning Hebrew. Paleo Hebrew, not Yiddish, not the Khazar Zion, not the Khazar Zionist or Khazar Jewish Yiddish, Yiddish pronunciation of Hebrew, but the origi original Paleo. Whether you're reading it in the Proto Sinaitic, which are the picture grams or picture graphs, which is Proto Sinaitic or whether you are reading it in the more modern Hebrew with the paleo pronunciation. Something I found in scripture a while ago, which I thought to be awesome about Hebrew. And it's also an indication as to why the Romans removed certain books from the Bible. So, all things being established in order. How let me let me lay this foundation first. People tell you all the time. People say, Oh, I don't read from those books, they're uninspired. Well, who told you they were uninspired? Who told you those books were uninspired? Who are you repeating? Who are they repeating? Who are they repeating? Who told you that the 80 books that have been in virtually every Bible, for the exception of the 1782 rendition that slaves were given with 66 books, 13 and a half books removed, who authorized that the books that they removed were uninspired? Who came up with that? Where did that come from? Who taught that? Were they children of Israel? Were they Gentiles? Who? Because if the idea is that those books are uninspired, well, let's, let's talk about what the Bible actually is. It is a family history book for the righteous. The 66 books that we have access to They were written by children of Israel. All of them. All of the books in the 66 book Bible were written and inspired by children of Israel. Bloodline children of Israel. So if someone's coming along after Israel who gets their hands on someone else's family's history? How are they offer, authorized to dictate what is inspired and what isn't in someone else's family? Now, it, 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 it happens to be that this family has a tradition of righteousness, which they found favor in God from the very beginning. From Noah, through Shem, through Abraham, through Isaac and Jacob. Israel. So if anyone is telling you that those books are uninspired and they're not from the family that the family record was written about, you might want to be careful coming to the conclusion off of something that you were told through conformity that those books are uninspired. Because once you take a moment to go into those books, 
you're able to gather very quickly why someone outside of the family might have wanted to um, remove or exclude it certain texts. Guess what we're going to talk about tonight? We're going to look at an example in one of the uninspired books to talk about what it says in that book. Now, I've posted the passage in the um, in the description of this video, but just to give you the backdrop for anyone who hasn't read the book of Jubilee. Moses was on the mountain for a while. The beginning of Jubilee explains that there was an instruction to give Moa, no Moa, to give uh, <laughs> Moses, <laughs> Moa, Moa, to give uh, Moses, there was an instruction to give Moses um, a reestablished story from creation up to that point for him to write down. Guess what the book of Jubilees is? It is that account from creation up to that point written down. Now, in Jubilees, there are certain things that are explained that aren't necessarily vital for most aspects of what we learn in the 66 book Bible. However, you might find them a bit intriguing. We're going to go into one example today. So the backdrop in this passage um, in Jubilees, the flood has just happened. They have just come off the ark. Um, the demonic spirits uh, from before the flood, they're tormenting Noah's grandsons. So Noah had three sons. He had Japheth, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll say them in the order of their age. He had Shem, Japheth, and Ham, oldest to youngest. And they have children. And their children are being tormented by these spirits, right? So um, Noah prays to the Most High. And, you know, he's, you know, he's like, you know, God, I've been... I've been righteous. I taught my kids to keep your law, statutes, and commandments, which is mentioned in Jubilee. So for anybody thinking that it started with Moses, no, it didn't. It, it started before Moses. The reteaching of the commandments, laws, and statutes. You will find that actually the law, statutes, and commandments were here in the very beginning from Adam. But hold on to the conversation. We're on this topic today. And so he, he's praying to God. And he's like, God, you know, we've been righteous. We thank you for saving us from this flood. The book of Jasher tells you there were 400,000 men before the flood. So seven survived out of 400,000 men. That's a remnant for you. That's the first remnant that was set apart. And so he's like, you know, can you please take this burden off of my grandchildren and my, and my sons and my son's sons concerning these demons that are tormenting them? And, you know, the Most High responds. And part of that response you know, I'll go to 24. He says, um, in 24, he says, and I shall be a God to thee and thy son and to thy son's son and to all thy seed. Fear not from henceforth and unto all generations of the earth. I am thy God. And the Lord God said, open his mouth and his ears that he may hear and speak with his mouth with the language which has been revealed. For it has it had ceased from the mouths of all the children of men from the day of the overthrow, talking about Babel. Let we're gonna go down in a second. And open and I opened his mouth and his ears and his lips. And I began to speak with him in Hebrew, in the tongue of creation. Now, check this out. This is what just happened. The book of Jubilees and Jasher explained to you in, in combination with the Bible, because that's the full 80 books. The full 80 book perspective is that when um, the children of Ham through Nimrod in Babylon was building this tower to, uh, to heaven. And it says, you know, we, we have to confound their languages because if not, there will be nothing that will be, uh, you know, they will not be able to accomplish. What the full P 
picture of the entire book, what it explains to you is there were 70 angels sent to confound the languages into 70 different languages. Okay, that's number one. All of the languages of men were, were changed. Originally, all men spoke Hebrew, the language of creation. But at Shinar, all the languages were confounded into 70 different, different tongues. And so what that does is it paints a picture for us that there were 70, there, were, there was one language, the language of creation, everybody spoke it. You had Babylon, the first great religion and society against the most high God. Those tongues were split. So those pagan traditions were also split into 70 tongues, right? Stay with me now. So you have one pagan religion split into 70, which Lord knows how many we have in the earth today. But that's that's where the splitting of titles of gods and goddesses and fallen angels. That's where all that started. But that's not the point I want to make here. God took the language of authority and creation from man because of the Tower of Babel. However, he gave that language back to Noah. Hebrew is the language of creation. We're not talking about this Yiddish Hebrew, this Khazar Yiddish stuff that came later. We're talking about Paleo Hebrew. It is the language of creation. I'm going to read it again now that we've given a backdrop. This is God talking to Noah right after the flood. I'm going to go back and read it again. 24. And I shall be a God to thee and thy son and to thy son's son and to all thy seed. Fear not from henceforth and until all generations of the earth. I am thy God. 25. And the Lord thy God said, open his mouth. And his ears that he may hear and speak his mouth with the language which has been revealed. Meaning I'm about to reveal again to you the language of creation because I split all the tongues in Babylon. For it, it, it had ceased from the mouths of all the children of men from the day of the overthrow. Talking about Babel, Tower of Babel and Shinar. And I opened his mouth and his ears and his lips. And I began to speak with him in Hebrew, in the tongue of creation. So what does this mean, people? Israel was allowed to keep the tongue of creation. Noah was able to keep the tongue of creation because he was righteous. We know that Israel spoke Hebrew. So contextually, you know that Noah through Shem taught Abraham because everything that we have is written in Hebrew, the language of creation, right? The children of Israel being righteous were authorized and allowed to continue speaking the language of creation. We know that in the Elohim, the three in one, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three are three separate things of one function. One Godhead. Three separate functions. The Son is the, is the testament and the example. The living word. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom. That gives you the wisdom of the word to understand how to use the truth of Christ in order to reach the Father. These three are of one function. We know that, right? Hebrew, Hebrew, language of, of creation. We know that Christ is the word. We know that any time the most high spoke, it was a implementation of Christ, that function of God. We know this. So if he created the earth in Hebrew, then Hebrew has a power that other tongues don't. Again, if Hebrew is the language of creation, then Hebrew has to have power and authority that other tongues do not have. Put it together. The children of Israel were allowed to keep the language of creation. God spoke and then it was in Hebrew. Now watch this. 
So you have the children of Israel speaking Hebrew, right? I study language. I study English. Uh, I study, now I'm studying Paleo Hebrew, right? Hebrew is a verb driven language. The verb comes first. Create the earth, he. The verb always comes first in Hebrew. I started to study um, words translated out of the Hebrew into other tongues. And what was revealed to me is that um, Hebrew is the direct contextual understanding of creation. There's nothing lost in understanding if you're reading it in Hebrew. Here's why. Language is an approximation of thought, right? Meaning, when you think an idea or think a concept, a word is the closest thing to that thought to express it. And, and for anyone who speaks more than one language, most of you who are bilingual or speak more than uh, two languages will agree. The language that you're taught, the structure of expression of thought that you're taught it sets the stage for how you process thought, how you think, how you think to express yourself, how you actually express yourself. With Hebrew, there's no drop off. Because if, if, if the earth was created in that language, then, then, then that language is the direct context by which everything that we do and operate in operates under. If you have a thought or idea that exists in Hebrew, there's no loss in there's no loss in understanding. When you start to speak in other languages, you have to work work around the fact that other languages lacks the language of uh, creation context to be able to conceptualize certain ideas. So, if the language of creation was Hebrew, as we just read in that scripture then contextually, the understanding of the things of God would be the most uh, 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 direct without losing correlation or context of another language in Hebrew. So that's something I just wanted to share with you today. I thought that was cool. I thought it was cool that, hey, there was a language in heaven. There was a language that was spoken and all men spoke it up until Babylon. God, through the angels, removed Though that language of authority or creation split it into 70 tongues with 70 different angels and then went back and said, you know what? You're righteous. You deserve to speak the language of creation. So there's a correlation between righteousness and the language you speak. And I'm not saying nobody's a devil worshiper for, for speaking the language that they speak. Clearly, I'm speaking English here. However... You can't say that there's no difference in reading and understanding things in English as, it, as pursuant to actually learning to read Hebrew, Paleo Hebrew, to be able to conceptualize and understand in the context of the creation language. Something to think about. There's something to think about. Check out those books. Check out. Jubilees, in Jasher, in Enoch, um, and you'll find that you'll find a lot of things. You're going to find out that law was here in the beginning. Law is not just a set of rules. It's design construct for us to guide our function. You're going to understand that commandments, laws, and statutes, they are three separate things with three separate functions working as one. Just like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three bear witness of each other working in tandem for one function. You'll find that mo more often than not, the Most High does things in multiples. There's always a witnessing. It's consistent. And so uh, you, you'll find that, the, you know, you have the commandments, you have the, um, you have the commandments, you have the, uh, uh, the laws and the statutes, which contextual to Hebrew you have the instructions, 
You have the guidelines and you have the enactments of those instructions or guidelines. Three separate things. And this is why all throughout the Old Testament, it said, you know, Abraham, I found righteousness with you because you kept my commandments, my instruction. You kept my laws, my guidelines. You kept my statutes, the enactment or implementation pursuant to my instruction and my guidelines. Certain things you cannot understand unless you uh, have, the, have the ability to see the context of these concepts in the language of creation. And so I'm learning Hebrew. I'm still tightening on it for the time being. Any word that I read in the, in the Old Testament, I look up in its, in its original tongue. Here's why. English is a less specific language pursuant to creation. And I can tell you that I know that because, for instance, in Hebrew, the word that means statue, again, Hebrew is a verb-driven language, right? The word that means statue in Hebrew can translate in context to how you use it in the sentence as a verb. Here's an example. Statue in the Old Testament in certain scriptures means to allocate, like allocate land, allocate food, allocate shares. It can mean to restrict or to limit, limit the amount of wheat that we give out to Israel during the famine. Uh, it could, or statute of limitation, statute. Um, it can mean allocate, it can mean limit, it can mean enact, it can mean um, step out on, or, uh, but it takes on all these different Contexts, but that one word in Hebrew means what it means based on the how it's used as a verb in the sentence. English is not structured that way, and so when you translate that word from Hebrew statute to English, they have to say um, allocate or limit or um, enact or um, execute. Like the like the like the judgments of Moses, they are statutes because they are enactments of punishment, enactments of atonement, uh, enactments of accountability. You know, and so I have found so many different things that I've been able to gather and understand because I am learning the language of creation to understand the context by which everything exists. That is how I was able to understand and, and, and determine that law is not a set of rules, not in itself. That's the indirect understanding. The direct understanding, looking at it from the context of creation, when God created something and saw that it was good, he saw that it was appropriately functional for his intention for it. And therefore, the, the laws are nothing more than a set of guidelines to, to, to uh, 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 guide the function of said thing. Like in the book of Enoch, one of the uninspired books, it tells you that God assigned a law to the sun, the moon, the stars, and everything that was ever created. Everything has a set of laws that guides its function. The only thing in the history of the world, in the world, that has defied the law of its own function humanity. And now we know that law was in heaven. It didn't start at earth. Law was in heaven. How do we know that? Because it said that Satan sinned in heaven first. Sin, we know, according to 1 John 3 and 4, sin is the transgression of the law. So we know that Satan sinned in heaven, which means there has to be law in heaven too. And how do we confirm that? Matthew 5, 18 says, Till heaven and earth be destroyed, not one jot, not one tittle shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So we know that Christ came to fulfill something, but he, but he hasn't come to fulfill everything because heaven and earth still here and law still here as a result of it. Heaven and earth. So definitely you want to um, take a look at this uninspired text because the ones telling you that it's uninspired, they weren't part of the family. 
It's a family book of family traditions. It just so happens that that family tradition is rooted in righteousness before the Most High because he set them apart to be to be that and to be that illustration and light to all other nations. So their family tradition was rooted in functionalism, according to the creator of all who saw that everything was appropriate, appropriately functional. It's their family history. So unless someone from the, uh, one of the tribes of Israel tells me that a book is uninspired, that was in the original family testimony, I'm not playing with it. I'm not taking it out. Check your 1611 King James Bible. See how many books are in there. Check. Do your homework on the history of, uh, of the Bible. I'm going to actually do a video on it soon. Because there's a lot of people that question, oh, you know, I don't know the Bible translation. Here's something cool for you. One of the texts. This is one of the texts that the Romans took out of the Bible. Uninspired. The book of Edris. Second Edris. Edris is basically chilling and um, God appears to Edris in a burning bush. Now peep this. He starts he starts having a Q&A session with the Most High. And, and, and the Most High qualifies himself immediately. He says, I'm the God that appeared to your forefather, Moses, on the mountain. He says, I spoke with him for, if I recall correctly, I spoke with him for many a days on that mountain. He's like, and I explained to him a lot of things. He was like, and I explained to him the understanding of times and prophecy. But much would I, much of the things which I explained to him, I told him to conceal. I told him to conceal. And when you understand that God had to tell him to conceal certain things like the understanding of times, go to Daniel 7.25. For they will look to change times and laws and it will be it will be given unto them for a time and season. God had to allow times and laws to be changed because prophecy says that 2000 years after the death of Christ, there would be a great awakening, which is the time we're living in Hosea six and two. Then a thousand years after that, the children of Israel and the remnant, the adopted through the adoption, the Gentiles, the number that cannot be counted. The ones that pass judgment will be walking in, in the kingdom. And so we had to allow times and laws to be changed, meaning Moses had to conceal certain understandings for us to get to this point. So for people to say, I don't understand why, why God would allow people to pervert scripture in them. It had to be allowed. It was already written. All of this is already written. All of this has already happened. We're just in the little timeline on the meter, living our part of it out. It's already happened. All this has already occurred. And so, um, no, it was, it was actually authorized that times and laws be changed. So that at the appropriate time, the children of the elect, the remnant, the lost children of Israel would reemerge and resurface and start to remember who they are again. So that they could return to their position of being a light to all people in all nations. It's going to be a slow process, but all this is written, you know. And so you will have a hard time understanding who's who in the earth without reading the lost text. Because Jubilees in, in particular, once they get off the boat and once we go through this passage here, um, there's, a, there's a story about how Shem, Japheth, and Ham, they make an agreement about land in that part of Africa. They make an agreement. Japheth takes the land to the north. Ham agrees to take the land to the west. Shem takes the land right there in that area. The agreement was a covenant. And the, the, the agreement was if any one of the sons of Noah... If them or their children took a land that wasn't part of that agreement, there would be a curse on those people. Now, the theologians would like to tell us that all black people came from Ham and we were in American slavery because of that curse. But that's that's not the truth. Ham is a completely different group of people. And reading the lost text lets you connect the dots all the way back to the flood. Who's who? 
all the way back to the flood who's who. So when I got people that talk to me and they, they're into ETEP or these other people that are into the Anaki tablets or all of these other teachings, Jasher and Jubilees, Jubilees actually tells you where those Anaki tablets came from. They found them after the flood. The, son, the grandsons of Ham found them after the flood. And he said that he was ashamed that he found the, the, the information because he knew it was wicked. And so he concealed his, his finding it from, from Noah. And that was the son of Ham. In the same generation that Nimrod rose to power because of that knowledge that they learned from the fallen angels. Well, Brian, that's what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. The Dead Sea Scrolls that were recovered in the 1830s. Let's go into that for a second to answer that question, to give you the backdrop on that. The, um, there was a group of um, Israelites after they fled out of Egypt. During the time that Moses and the, uh, and the generations of Moses were in the wilderness, after they uh, became wicked and God said, you know what? I pulled y'all out of Egypt, but y'all bugging. So I'm going to hold my promise. Israel is going to make it into the land that I promise you, but you won't. You're going to sit in this wilderness until you die off and I'll make sure your children get in. And so um, there was a group of Levites through that uh, through that exodus that that veered off and went their own course. They never went into the land of Israel um, and they had a copy of the text. The Old Testament, they had a copy of it and not just the Old Testament that we know about. The Apocrypha was part of the Old Testament and the pre-flood text was part of the, the original Testament. They call it Old Testament. I call it original. And so those, uh, they were called the Essenes. When you look it up, it's E-S-S, -S, not A. Not, not to get confused with the Assyrians, but the Essenes, the Essenes, they, um, they hit a copy of their, uh, their copy of the text in these jars and hid them in the Kremlin caves. They were recovered by an excavation team in the 1830s, uh, headed up by R.H. Charles who had no bias to any type of um, religious institution. His mission was simply to preserve human history. So there wouldn't be a better man to discover these outside of maybe Israel, but it wouldn't be a better man to discover these because his goal was not rooted in perverting anything. His goal was uh, uh, rooted in preservation, whatever he finds. And so the, the, the team... Uh, uh, headed up by R.H. Charles, they found and translated the Dead Sea Scrolls, pre-flood text included. Now, the Catholics had previously, by this point, disposed of any text that they didn't want us to consider inspired. You have the Book of the Maccabees. There's four of them. There's two in the Apocrypha. There's two more in what the Romans call the Suyagrapha or the false books. They're telling you you're, they're false so you don't ever look in them. But when you actually go into the Suyagrapha books where Enoch and all the pre-flood texts is, that's when you realize, oh, here's how I tell the first day of the year according to God. It's the first day of spring. The day when morning and evening are equal parts. On the 52nd Sabbath of the year, when the sun sets, that's the new day. That's when I'm supposed to start counting forward to, forward to keep all the feasts mentioned in uh, Leviticus 23. But you wouldn't know that because God had to allow times and laws to be changed for time and season. Which you also find in the laws text, which is actually cool. God is calling out all of the foolishness before it even happens. He was like, you're going to have people that start adding days to the calendar. They're not going to. They're not going to say it's 364 any day anymore. They're going to start saying it's more days than 364. All the days are going to be dislodged. They're going to start keeping pagan holidays. They're going to they're going to stop keeping the holy days. They're going to start keeping the holy days on the wrong days. They're going to get confused on all the days, the months, and the years. You're going to got you're going to have some people who observe the moon and think that they're supposed to use the moon to keep time. And when they do that, they're going to be off 10 days a year, like the Jewish people whose calendar has 354 as opposed to 364 because they're observing the moon, moon worship. 
Just like the crescent moon in the Islamic faith that no one knows. The, the God of the Shashu, Allah, is the God of the Shashu, which is the same God that the, the Catholics worship, which is why they have the sun and the moon, the crescent moon, and it's, it's symbolism. Same religion. Remember we said earlier, Babylon, 70 different languages, same pagan religion, 70 different religions, 70 different titles. So anywho, um, there's a lot of information that the powers to be want you to believe is uninspired. I would, I would challenge anyone to not take my word for anything. Get you an R.H. Charles edition of the Pseudographa, Pseudographa and the Apocrypha, which was in the 1611 Bible, that our American government agreed for the 1782 uh, King James Bible, which had 14 and a half books removed. Um, they authorized to have that one pressed uh, post-slavery because they didn't want us to look into the Apocrypha books because it tells you who you are if you're in America by way of slavery. It tells you who you are. That's why they took it out. That's why they took it out. You know, and so um, I challenge anyone. Take a look at the R.H. Charles rendition of the Apocrypha and the Pseudographa books. Because the pre-flood information um, explains everything. Explains everything. It, it tells you where the Babylonian gods come from. In fact, you can actually correlate the Babylonian gods to, you can attribute them to the fallen angel, which they were, which they were worshiping. You can follow that to the, uh, the Chaldee, which was into divination. Enoch tells you the fallen angels that taught us divination, that taught us astrology. God didn't give us astrology. He gave us astronomy. You can, follow, you can understand um, where divination came from and why it's such a, 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 a thing in the earth now. Again, 70 tongues, 70 traditions. Um, you can follow the tread, the breadcrumbs from the fallen angels to the worship in Babylon, to the worship in Egypt, to, to, to the Catholics, uh, uh, who got the Greeks who got their traditions from Alexander, the Greek who got it from the Egyptians, which is why in America you have so much Egyptian, uh, uh, imagery, uh, in, in our, in our Masonic produced and built centers. It's because they worship the same gods. Rome didn't fall, it just went underground. The Catholic Church worships the same gods. They just renamed them Hebrew characters. Same gods. Why do you think in Washington, D.C., in London, and in the Vatican, you have Egyptian symbolism everywhere? So for anybody who likes to um, argue this, this idea, oh, uh, the Bible was written by white people and our oppressors, guess what? The Egyptians oppressed us too. So did the so did the uh, um, so did uh, Ishmael's kids, the Ishmaelites. They own as many slave ships as Jewish people. I'm gonna be honest with you. I haven't gone into that yet. I, I I've looked into it, but I haven't gone into detail because I'm I'm in a different season right now. I'm I'm in a season of I'm reproofing uh, Jubilees again because there, it's so meaty. I had to go through it a second time. Um, at some point, I'm going to go through the patriarch to, to determine um, there, there is text that explains um, the prophecy given to each one of the sons of Jacob. Um, and I do want to look at that. There's actually one that talks about how God calmed the Atlantic waters to, to allow Gad to travel to the west to a land never inhabited by man. If anybody who's done their research, they know that Gad is the North American Indian. If anybody's done their research, they know that Christopher Columbus and his logs will tell you that they came to the Americas with a uh, with Hebrew translators because the Masons knew who were here because they had access to scripture. They knew who were here. They had access to the prophecy. So deep enough for tonight. Um, two things I will challenge anybody. Take a look at the pre-flood text. Take a look at Jasher, which is not a person. Jasher means the book, the journal of the righteous, the sons of Adam. 
the righteous sons of Adam, up to Noah, and so forth. It was handed down through the family. For anybody who wants to argue that language uh, started on earth or it started with Egypt, no, it didn't. That's a lie. That's another reason they took those books out. Because if you had those other books, you know that language didn't even start on earth. You will know, according to Jasher and Jubilees, that there are tablets in heaven with laws written on them. And, and I just read this today that um, it says that it was written on the heavenly tablets that God found great righteousness with Abraham. God found such right, righteousness with Abraham. They documented it in heaven. Language didn't start on earth. Writing and documenting didn't start on earth. So for anybody who believes that, then you would have a hard time believing in the pre-flood text. And that's what the Catholics want you to believe because they want you to submit to their to their gods, which are the gods of Egypt. You ever wonder why so many white people play Egyptians in movies? Because they want they want you they want you to worship their gods. It's their gods. And people make it a color thing, but it's not a color thing. It's really not. It's a bloodline thing. It's not a color thing. It's not the land you're named after. No, it's a bloodline thing. You had one bloodline who had a family tradition of following things all the way back to Adam. Then you had all the other bloodlines that decided to do whatever they wanted. Chasing after the tradition of the fallen angels that taught them wickedness in the world. It's only one or the other. It's only one or the other. And so when you read Jasher, Jubilee, and Enoch, you know off rip, okay, well, I know what's God's because I see in Jubilees, Commandments, statutes, and, and, and law was taught to Noah's sons, was taught to Abraham, was taught to Isaac and Ishmael initially. It was taught to Jacob. It was taught to Moses. God made a, a point with every person that he saw as an elect or as set apart in their traditions or obedient to the Most High. They spoke Hebrew. They kept the law, statutes, and commandments. They didn't they did not hearken to the, the, the traditions of the world. Christ included. Reoccurring theme people, anytime something is true in the Bible, you will see it several times throughout. Scripture always witnesses scripture, you know, so. Take a look at the lost text, take a look at Hebrew. Use your strongest concordance to start looking up words written in English to understand the true meaning of them in the language of creation, to get the direct context, the context of these ideas, because language is nothing more than an idea or a concept. You want the contextual understanding of the language of creation to be your foundation and understanding. I'm reading, Brian. Interesting that you are mission to search for answers and the true answers will set us free and is important because the world's about to shift. Oh, yeah, the world's actually the world's totally shifting. And um, prophecy tells us there's going to be a remnant. It says in Revelation uh, 12, 17, the dragon is angry with the woman, the remnant of her seed. That's not everybody. The remnant of her seed that keeps the, the laws of God or the commandments of God and the testimony of Christ. So who does that cancel out right away? Who does that? How many people does that cancel out? You got the two largest religions in the world. Christianity, Catholicism, slash, and Islam. How many of them keep the laws and testimony of Christ? Christians keep the testimony of Christ. Half of them don't keep the laws. Half the Hebrew Israelites keep the law, but not the testimony of Christ. The Jewish secretly don't keep none of it. Except for Sabbath, because they know that there's a blessing attached, and they and they secretly study the Kabbalah in the Talmud. You got Hebrew Israelites, some of them that study the T Talmud in the Old Testament, and say, "Screw the New Testament." How many people actually keep the the commandments and testimony of Christ? There's your remnant. It's not going to be a lot of people. Ten percent of Israel. The number outside of Israel cannot be counted, but it's not going to be a lot of people. It's a remnant, one way or the other. Whether you are bloodline or whether you are adopted as a stranger through your through adop adopting the traditions of the tr children of Israel, it's not going to be a lot of people. And so the fact that uh, God authorized certain things to be concealed so that those who had a heart to truly find the answers 
would actually find them. That's not by coincidence. That's by design. There's a, uh, there's a, a brother. There's several. Um, the Gathering of Christ Church, if you take the Hebrew Academy, they actually teach you Hebrew in there. Conversational as well as the, uh, the ability to read it. It takes a lot of practice. Once you get the, um, once you get the vowel pronunciations down, it makes it a lot easier um, to speak it. Um, to read is interesting because it just you have to you have to come out of English, an English school of thought in order to um, conceptualize the ideas because they come in a different package. People, you have to understand language is a package of ideas. For instance, in Russian, in most Russian dialects, you have emotion etched into the prefix and suffix of words. Emotion. So I was with a friend one time. He's Russian. He's um, Moldovian, actually. And uh, where he comes from in Moldovia, they speak Russian, too. And uh, he was somewhere and this woman was talking to him in Russian. And I'm just sitting there watching his demeanor. And he just started put, putting his head down like she's yelling at him. But she wasn't yelling. He just starts putting his head down like he's ashamed. She walks off and she was just speaking all calm. And I'm listening to her. I was listening to her speak to him. And, and when she walks off, like, um, Nikolai, what, what, did, what, did she, uh, what did she say to you? He was like, well, she was leaning on me. He was like, in my language, you can cuss at people and yell at them without raising tone. And so he was explaining to me that their language is, is it has tone etched into the language, which is why reading Russian literature is, is so emotional and passionate because it's etched into the language. Every language has its criteria by which um, the, 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 the idea, the vehicle by which the idea is, is sent is different pursuant to the language and how it's constructed. And so Hebrew is very unique in the vehicle that it sends the idea through. Very unique. And it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that every other language is that much different than Hebrew because Hebrew is the language of creation. And God wanted to split the tongues of men into a lesser, a lesser language pursuant to understanding the language of creation. So, yeah, I'll, I'll shoot you guys some information for those who are interested in um, learning paleo. Um, it is awesome. And it, it kind of renews the way that you uh, think because of how it's structured being verb driven and not being noun driven. Um, it, it's, it's just different. It makes you think differently. It makes you conceptualize differently. You ga gather revelation differently because of the delivery of the thought coming to you based on the language. So anywho, I want to put that tidbit out there tonight. Um, I hope all is well. I hope everyone has a blessed Sabbath and you get some rest and some, ch and some t time to study or or look at things for yourself or question things, but don't take my word for anything. Go look at the stuff for yourself. Be a student of the word. You know, I'm not ab above reproof. Perhaps you'll find something and you'll be like, Mario, you got this incorrect. Go back and repent or reproof yourself. Reproof, reproofing is needed in order to grow and understand things correctly. So um, love is correction. Let's not forget that. Shabbat Shalom. Oh, one more thing. Shalom is um, a Yiddish pronunciation of Shalom. Shalom is the Paleo Hebrew. So where Shalom is spelled S H A L A uh, L O M, S H A L O M, that's Yiddish. The word in Paleo is Shalom, which is um, S H A L A M, which means um, safe or in a position of peace. And Shalom is just, uh, in, in Hebrew, you have root words. And then you have words that are built on root, just like just like English. English, we have root words and then we have prefixes and suffixes that we can add to them to create other words. Hebrew does share that in common. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely, definitely look into it. Uh, look into the lost text and Hebrew. So until next time, Shalom.